It was on December 7th, we we're at the Japanese United Methodist Church when one of the members named Al Tsukamoto announced that Japan had attacked uh, Pearl Harbor. And that was the beginning of a life of misery for, for our family and many Japanese American families. When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and President Roosevelt signed the Executive Order 9066, we were forced into the American concentration camp. And it is a concentration camp. It has barbed wires around all perimeters, and it has watchtowers, and uh, has searchlights, and it's manned 24 hours a day with armed guards. Evacuation. More than 100,000 men, women, and children, all of Japanese ancestry, removed from their homes in the Pacific Coast states to wartime communities established in out-of-the-way places. Their evacuation did not imply individual disloyalty, but was ordered to reduce a military hazard at a time when danger of invasion was great. Two-thirds of the evacuees are American citizens by right of birth. The rest are their Japanese-born parents and grandparents. The people are not under suspicion. They are not prisoners. They are not internees. They are merely dislocated people, the unwounded casualties of war. The order indicated, uh, among other things, that uh, you, you were to be prepared to be, to be taken someplace, and uh, all you were allowed to bring with you was what you can carry. That means that everything you have literally is gone, and only what you really need as personal effects is all you can, you can take. Uh, it has an unreal in impact. I'm sure it would have an unreal impact on anybody. So my mother, first thing she did was uh, burn all the photographs that she received from Japan, pictures of her mother and family, and letters that she had received from her mother. She burned everything. At the time, they felt that the Japanese on the West Coast might sabotage, you know. Of course, there was no evidence uh, before, during, or after the war that uh, any sabotage was uh, done by the Japanese or the Japanese Americans. It was a shock uh, to the entire community. And being that my father was a leader in the community, there were many uh, of his peers, business people, that were picked up soon after Pearl Harbor. But my father uh, was not picked up by the FBI until uh, February the 21st. It was uh, early in the morning and there were Actually, five FBI men in plain clothes. All they showed was their FBI badge and came into the house and start searching uh, the, our entire home. Uh, many of the picture family albums uh, they went through and actually ripped up the pictures that, like the lumber business that he was in, he was exporting lumber. And so there were many pictures of the lumber camps. And I noticed that they were, and, and shipyards and ports, and so they ripped up these pictures and put these in the box. In Clarksburg, um, there was one family that was uh, very helpful to us, and, and because she was sympathetic to the Japanese, uh, everybody else in the Clarksburg community, the Caucasian that is, labeled her a communist, but she didn't care. She helped us anyway. She was a school teacher um, at the time, uh, she spoke up for us. Uh, she didn't think it was right that, you know, they were interning uh, us when we hadn't done anything. And she would uh, do anything that she could to help us to evacuate. And she was the only one in that community. We were um, transported by train to Topaz, and there I remember 
that we had to keep the shades down in the train because this all was a rather secret uh, operation. As we went through the wide open spaces, the military police would come through the cars and tell us as we were coming into even small town stations to lower the shades in the windows. And then when we passed the little stations, we could raise them again. The time, spring and summer of 1942. The place, 10 different relocation centers in unsettled parts of California, Arizona, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, and Arkansas. The railroad w went to Lone Pine from Los Angeles, so people got on the train at Union Station, and that's how they got a large majority of Japanese Americans out of Los Angeles up to Lone Pine, and then a bus would deliver them into the camp. And sometimes they'd come in, you know, be a long, that's a long day of travel. They'd come in when it was dark and they couldn't see what their future homes were like. And then, you know, shockingly, they'd wake up the next morning. It's like, oh my Lord, what is, you know, this? Just wood and tar paper barracks. And we're out here in the middle of nowhere. And, um, you know, we've got military police with bayonets and guns. And, uh, geez, what a shock. Um, or they'd come in and they'd, they wouldn't be able to see the camp because there was a huge dust storm. You know, all they saw this big brown cloud, and somewhere in that brown cloud <laughs> was, their, was their new home. Most people were shocked to see what was outside. Their country was pretty much like what we see out here in Manzanar. Sagebrush, sand, and open ground, very few trees. Housing from seven to 18,000 people. Barrack-type buildings divided into compartments. 12 or 14 residence buildings to a block. Each block provided with a mess hall, bathhouse, laundry building, and recreation hall. About 300 people to a block. We opened the door, we looked inside. The only thing that was inside was uh, two by four partitions. No sheet rocks or no plywood. So you can see from one end to the other end of the building. It's just a long building. So we had in our barracks was a 160 watt light bulb, stove it uh, for heat, and the, then we had a, a one cotton mattress for each person. That's all there was. Because the camp was still being built, uh, there were just roughly about 12 to 16 blocks of barracks actually available for housing. So people were sardined in here in huge numbers. In a room like this, you might have eight to 10 uh, people. But the hardest part was, uh, you know, to get a room, a room 20 by 25. I had a sister, 19 years old. What would you do to give her a little privacy? A lot of people just hung the rope and hung the blanket because they issue us two, two blankets per person, that GI blanket. So that's what a lot of people did. Manzanar, like most of the camps, was built from very green lumber that dried out tremendously, shriveled up in the, the dry conditions of a desert environment like the Owens Valley. So these little narrow spaces began to grow and get wider and wider. So when you swept the floor, they, you know, the raw lumber, that cat crack between the lumber. So you swept the dust, it goes down to the floor. So you didn't need a dustpan. So the wind blow, it come back up, up again. You talk about recycling dirt, you know. You were usually, when you got off the bus, you were given, uh, you know, the three army blankets and a bag. Somebody pointed the straw pile and said, you know, go fill up your mattress. And here was my mother carrying a long sack, uh, dragging a long sack. And she had just filled it with straw uh, at the pile that they had left at each block, straw and they issued body bags, well, mattress bags. We found out later they were body bags. Everything was communal. That, that was one of the hardest things. You know, you go to the bathroom or anything, you no know, stall, don't forget. You sat side by side in a regular outhouse, someplace back to back. That was, I think that was one of the hardest things to get used to. Because it, it, even a mess, you know, the family structure broke down because you ate in the mess or ate in the table. 
In other words, your, your folks was there, fine, we ate. If the, there, there, we never as a, sat and talked as a family. If you had teenagers, they were never with you. They ate with their friends, they ran around with their friends, they didn't have to listen to the parents so much, they had to follow the curfew and be inside by, you know, maybe 8 o'clock. But the rest of the time, they were free to roam wherever they wanted to. The 300 or so residents of each block eat in a mess hall, cafeteria style. Rough wooden tables with attached benches. The food is nourishing, but simple. A maximum of 45 cents a day per person is allowed for food. And the actual cost is considerably less than this for an increasing amount of the food is produced at the center. I hated the milk. I don't know what kind of milk it was, but it, it just smelled bad, and I was told it was goat's milk. Maybe because they had goats around there. But if you had money, if you had a nickel, you could get a half a pint of milk in a bottle. It tasted so good, because it wasn't goat's milk. My parents sent me to Japanese school in the morning and English school in the afternoon. You know, I played baseball and probably some touch football. There were games like kick the can and, and um, tag, a lot of games that didn't require any equipment. There were no swings or slides for kids to play on. So we did whatever we had to do um, to entertain ourselves. And mostly it was playing marbles in the sand. I went through the first grade in Topaz, and I, I went there not knowing a word of English. And I had to learn English and um, say the Pledge of Allegiance to a flag that was by the door. And I didn't know what I was saying, you know, I didn't know what liberty and justice for all meant. But I said it because we were told to do that, and, but uh, when I grew up, I learned to, I really became resentful that here I was a prisoner in my own country, treated like um, a foreigner. The internment of the Japanese Americans was a horrendous violation of constitutional rights. Our constitution that guarantees equal rights to all the people without regard to race or color it was violated. And so in, it's important that the constitution is upheld. It's up to all of us to keep it alive. And how do you do that? Is if we see anyone's civil rights being violated, we need to speak out. We have to continue to educate people of the the, the wrong, the tragic wrong of displacing people from their normal life without some valid reason so that um, uh, more people understand what had happened in the past and to make sure they will not be repeated in the future. Myself and, and my wife Christine, we've been doing the Florin Time of Remembrance for 20 years plus. And I had thought about you know, doing this kind of program uh, and maybe it was time perhaps to, to, to you know, say, that's enough, we're preaching to the choir. However, 9-11 occurred, and all of a sudden, the thin veneer of tolerance was ripped off, and now the Arabs and the Muslims get the brunt of it all. Today, when you find a lot of stuff going on that uh, uh, reminds us of what happened to us then, uh, although I think the difference now is that there are enough thinking Americans who uh, 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 would not let that happen. We need to be able to speak out. And I know I was critical of my mother for not speaking out at that time. But the more I learn, I realize you didn't have a voice because the circumstances didn't allow you that voice. Now we have a voice, we have a responsibility. We still live in a wonderful country, but it can be better. And I'm not sure that we're taking advantage of what we have. And we need to stop and think and make it better. Because if we don't, we could lose some of the things that we have right now. And that's why 
these stories and these lessons are important.